So the FCC did a few um, concerning things uh, in the last couple weeks uh, that uh, could potentially dramatically defund community media, community technology work, and digital inclusion work in our country, especially at the city and county level. Um, specifically with um, something that pertains to the cable franchise agreements. Um, in essence, this mechanism would make it possible for the cable companies to an assign an in-kind value to uh, the cash portion of the contract with the city. And that could just zero out or make very small that cash component. And cities, some cities put that into their general fund. Some people, some cities put that into community technology programs. Um, a lot of them put it into public access um, and education and government television. Uh, so that is, is, a, is a huge threat to the fabric. And we can get more into how that impacts community radio as well. Um, but largely, that's, that's a really immediate big thing. Um, the other immediate big thing is that uh, they made a ruling about the infrastructure build out for the 5G network. Um, and the basic thing about that is that they want to preempt local authority, uh, a city's ability to charge for rent for putting uh, the 5G infrastructure, which is kind of the size of a pizza box or a backpack. Um, on utility poles. So a city like San Jose um, has an agreement right now with Verizon, I think, mm -hmm. um, to put that cash value, that rent, at $2,500. This mechanism would put that at cost or very little. Um, and that cuts off our future opportunities to have more revenue for digital inclusion programs at cities, as well as precedents for public access. Um, and uh, there are some who say that it, even doing this, even giving away $2 billion in local assets to these, cap to these companies uh, just won't even address the rural broadband question or the rural internet access question that these companies say this will address. So those are some really broad concepts for some things that have very long and confusing names. Um, and I'm going to leave that groundwork at that. I think we'll also be covering some additional things. How's that sound? How did I sum that up? That's great. You did a great job. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just made a nightmare uh, <laughs> summarized in the Cliff Notes version. When I took this position at Metro East Community Media, I was brought in to uh, usher in disruption and change because it was coming. And my predecessor, many of you may know, Rob Brading, was uh, CEO very successfully for 24 years and realized that he needed to step aside to give uh, on-ramp to the next uh, woman or man that came in to reinvent the business model for community media because of people cutting the cord. So just two and a half years ago, it was all about Oh, cutting the cord, and, and, and that is going to diminish our, our revenue. And this FCC order and the potential of three people to fundamentally destroy the Cable Act and you know key parts of our society uh, seems pretty frightening and more of concern to me as a community media center leader than what I was doing last night, which was sitting in an ascertainment preparation meeting to get ready for the renegotiation of the franchise for this area four and a half years from now. We may be wasting our time if these other forces or things happen. And so that, that's that been unsettling for me the last two weeks. I, I, you know, It was one thing to hear about it about a year ago. It was another thing to just see how all of the forces in our country are moving and how the investment that we all have made as the, the public in the public right of way and in infrastructure of the country that we're about to get ripped off and that there will be no public benefit returned to the communities um, in addition to some sort of Mickey Mouse, well, I shouldn't even disparage, disper disparage the name of Mickey Mouse, some awful flat fee that they're proposing um, 
it's 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 quite unsettling. Right. Um, as uh, well, thank you for allowing me uh, uh, to be here. Um, it, it's a, a, a truly a pleasure to reconnect with many of you and to meet um, some more. Uh, hopefully continually good friends. Now, if you were to look at all of this, I have a tendency to look at things in broad strokes. I'm not an attorney, I'm not an engineer, so the intricacies scare me, um, but the broad strokes I can get. And if you were to look at, no matter what we're going to speak about today, if it's net neutrality, you know, um, this uh, cable uh, communication policy, you know, the interpretation of the Policy Act, if we were to look at the infrastructure item, there's been this decades-old tension between the users and the owners. Now that's what it boils down to. Um, and who has the most power and clout to influence policy, uh, you know, to help enact laws, and who maybe um, sometimes on the sidelines or um, on the menu, as we um, often say when it comes to that. So you know, take what is is uh, what was uh, the further notice that I guess was circulated last week. Um, that is for those of you who um, are into numbers. It is the media bureau docket number zero five three eleven. Um, go, you can look that up and, and see. This is a second further order or notice of proposed rulemaking, which means they're going to request the public. Um, particularly those who have standing, and that's a, be another um, issue for uh, if you look at some of the other Prometheus and other filings, um, you know, to weigh in and look at their tentative conclusions because they've made tentative co conclusions here uh, when it comes to what counts in that 5% um, uh, structure. You know, what is the definition or what's exclu excluded in terms of those these type of in-kind services? And, and to me, um, and and I, I don't, uh, I'm not a gloom and doom, I'm just a, a realist, and the older I get, the more real it gets. Um, <laughs> the biggest thing that I, and, and looking at this item, is to really ensure that you can minimize any harm. And I don't know how else to put it. Um, because there, uh, it, when you hear the FCC talk about tentative conclusions, uh, the word tentative is tentative. <laughs> um, and, and so you really have to look and, and I think take everything that you read in this, it's not a long docket, it's not a long item, um, you know, literally, and see what you can do and say and weigh in uh, to make it work better for your communities, making the assumption that the tentative conclusions, you know, those are, that's the direction in which they head. Now, the infrastructure item, I, you know, I find that especially um, significant in a lot of ways troubling. I have no problem with uh, the agency or any of us streamlining rules, um, expediting a deployment of next generation services. I have no problem with that. But when they talk about the probable saving of $2 billion, that's coming from local communities. Those are fees or services or what may have been charged that will no, no longer flow to communities. Mm -hmm. What is the cost of that? Two billion dollars is the savings that is uh, per, uh, supposed. But what's the cost of that? A, a case in point, I was in um, Mesa, um, you know, speaking to the mayor. Um, if it's a secret, he shouldn't have told me. Um, and what he said a, a year and a half ago is Arizona capped, um, you know, the, uh, the fees that uh, cities can charge for some of these small cell deployment. And I think about two, 250. Now, if it costs you 350 or 500 to, um, you know, to institute this when you, when you talk about labor and all of the others, then that city is upside down, economically upside down, and in essence, subsidizing, um, they're subsidizing um, what, um, you know, industry that can afford to pay, um, you know, is doing. So, you know, to me, um, I, I might have shown a little bias, but what we're talking about here is a lot of communities that want connectivity, infrastructure, and opportunities. But they cannot afford to go through the processing of these because they have small staffs. Um, and if 150, 200 applications come in at a time and you only have 60 days to sift through this, you know, 120 days if it's a poll attachment, and on average it takes you 150 to 200 days, 
then what does that bode? Um, would it be a rubber stamping? Would it be, you know, just what would that mean? And so these are the types of things that, again, $2 billion in savings sounds wonderful. But what are the long-term costs uh, to the communities? Now, we can talk about net neutrality and how this um, is interwoven because it's significant still on the infrastructure side. Because, again, the FCC may, has made it very clear that when it comes to state and local communities, you have no real seat at the regulatory uh, table, that we are going to preempt you from doing the types of things that you feel you can do to connect your communities to make sure that there's a public interest standard, um, you know, um, that that's under the consideration when you come to, um, you know, uh, infrastructure bills or, um, you know, the, all the things that we're talking about. So these three see, things are woven, um, they're, they're tightly knit. Uh, they might be different dockets and call different things, but they're very much complementary. And to begin, the end how I began, it's the tension or the friction between the owners and the users. You know, and to pick up on that thread, I'm so glad you brought up the issue of net neutrality because many people don't understand that the grandmother of net neutrality started right here in Portland, Oregon, just down the street. And I think it's really helpful. You know, sometimes our understanding um, can change depending on where we pick up the thread of history. And I think it's really important to look at it holistically. So I want to digress for one minute to give people an understanding of what happened here. For as long as the internet has existed, it has been grounded on the principle of non-discrimination. What you access online shouldn't be favored, blocked, slowed down, or differentially provided based on where the content is coming from or who provides it. Well, um, for those of us of a certain age, we remember dial-up modem. Um, back in 1998, uh, because we have local cable franchising authority, AT&T, when the cable modem began to look like a promising platform, said, hey, we're going to invest in this, and I think we can make a lot of money. So they came to local governments, including Portland, and said, hey, we're taking over your local cable company, TCI. And we said, great, we want your investment. And we the platform will be open to the 30 internet service providers that are providing service right now. Mine was teleport, you know, back at that time. Well, guess what the response was? No way. This is our platform. We're going to be the only provider on it. And they sued us. Well, we won in district court. The district court, and I want to say that uh, Portland Cable Access at the time petitioned the judge and was allowed to film the whole proceeding. So that proceeding actually is available and it's very instructive to community organizing today. Um, so we won. They said, of course, you know, since the 1934 Communications Act, this platform is open. It has to be open to any provider that wants to, to uh, per, you know, offer service. So, well, AT&T appealed to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit ruled that it was an information service, and there was local governments cannot regulate at that level. Um, then the FCC in 2002 issued the cable modem order, which was then upheld in a key case that many people refer to as the Brand X case. And that was a internet service provider, Brand X, wanted on to the cable modem platform and the National Cable Television Association sued. And the Supreme Court in a 6-3 ruling upheld that the cable modem service was an information service. And actually, I think Commissioner Clyburn is the expert on what has transpired since then. But I think it was just right after Governor Brown signed the net neutrality order in California, the Justice Department is suing. Within hours. Within mm -hmm. hours, so that had been planned. But basically, it's, it's something for all of us to watch and be active in with our electeds, even though it is in the courts, because the FCC is basically saying, um, no, we're not going to regulate it. Nobody can regulate it. And I think many of us understand that access to the Internet today 
is like a utility. It's an essential service. Uh, kids can't do their homework. People can't pay their bills. You can't access benefits online. It really is a utility, and historically, um, there's a role for government when something is a utility. Yet, our FCC is saying there is no role. We'll just let it be the Wild West and anything goes. That's something really important for us to pay attention and continue to be very active on net neutrality because it's directly related to digital equity, digital inclusion, and ensuring that everybody has the opportunity to be online, have a device, know how to use it. And right now in our country, we have about 20% of our households aren't online, don't have devices, and don't know how to use it. And if you look at some of the demographics, the numbers pop up even higher. Um, so it's a really important issue for all of us to be aware of and active on and help educate others who don't understand. When you look at going back to, um, uh, you can almost, if you talk to professors like Wu and, and the others, you can almost go back to the, um, the Nixon administration of where this kind of, of you know, fight, uh, excuse me, we don't use the word fight, tensions, um, you know, you know, began because you had um, um, those of you in the room um, who can remember, as you, uh, you know, mentioned, uh, uh, Mary Beth, um, that um, you had this nationwide incumbent, AT and T, the actual architect. We'll give them credit, the actual mm -hmm. architect of this infrastructure. But then, uh, during that administration, you saw an FCC that recognized um, that there were businesses who could had possibilities and probabilities, and really, honestly, um, had the promise of creating incredible business models over top mm -hmm. over the top of these networks. So that's when you, you know, businesses um, um, uh, that a uh, couple of them, you know, no longer exist today, um, that you saw that were the precursors to the Googles and the Netflixes and the like that we, um, that, uh, uh, that ran over these networks. So, so you had that going. And the tension and the protection that the FCC initially offered was that we want this to, to uh, it's nascent and we see promise um, in it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to create rules that are more inclusive and competitive um, so that, um, you know, this over the top, what we call over the top now, that, um, you know, uh, these network, um, you know, owners, um, the incumbents could, could not, um, you know, disadvantage, overly disadvantage uh, uh, traffic. You know, tra fast forward to now. Again, I keep going, you know, history keeps, you know, us in, in a spinning top because it's the same argument. Um, the incumbents, uh, to include cable now, um, who have a very significant, um, you know, uh, uh, internet, um, you know, broadband presence, you know, they're saying we put money in these networks. These edge providers, that, you know, when we talk about you, you should not be able to roam or, or use these networks for free. Who are you to say, um, you know, uh, you know, to use this, no matter how enabling, um, you know, the technology? Um, so, you know, again, you know, we could go and and, and, and kind of map it because I've got it all written now that I can't see anymore because. Um, but the 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 issue uh, now is over the use of the pipes. I mean, that's that's what it boils down to, and you saw that evolution, you know, with those virtual private networks. And if you remember Vonage, that was a nice little inflection point. You know, Vonage said, "Okay, we can, you know, make calls and do all these things over the internet, basically for free." And you know, who did that freak out? I don't have to tell you. And so, and uh, while some of us in, in the early stages benefited from, you know, free or low cost. The incumbents were not going to have it with Skype and, and all of these, uh, you know, other entities that the public just wanted, embraced. But the incumbents said, hold on, wait a minute. And so um, to be totally repetitive, if you want the ABCs of it, I mean, we can always say it boils down to money. But it's a bit more nuanced than that. I mean, that drives all of it. But it's a bit more nuanced than that. And when you talk about the FCC back in 20, uh, 2004, 
uh, that talked about, uh, you know, we might have a little issue here, the internet's still nascent, but we think we should lay out uh, four freedoms, four, um, you know, internet freedoms dealing with, you know, access to content, applications, you know, using a device of your choice if it's not harmful to network, um, to the network, and yes, competition. We want a, comp a competitive ecosystem. We're going to lay out these guidelines or, or these principles to follow. And the more current FCC, you know, uh, starting in um, the, the late, uh, in the um, Obama administration said, you know, we've got too many tensions um, and, 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 and too many complaints. And so that's when you saw the first, second, and um, third, meaning a 2015 iteration of uh, net neutrality um, in a formal sense, uh, bringing rules as opposed to principles and, and a general person's agreement, because we thought, um, the administration thought that there were too many bottlenecks and, and problems within the network um, make, when it comes to access. And the principle, if you were to talk to you know, Marty and, and, and you know, all of the, um, the inventors of the internet, they will tell you that the internet itself, the principles, automatically protected and included everyone. Mm -hmm. but that was by design. Um, it, 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 was, it, was, um, it was designed to be an open um, platform that, um, that the incumbents, uh, the, 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 the architects, so to speak, of the, um, the infrastructure build were not supposed to be the ones who were, were calling the shots. Um, we have definitely morphed into an, another, um, a, 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 another time and another place and another interpretation, I guess is the best way uh, to put it. And that's where we are, and it impacts every single thing that we're talking about today. They're just d direct impacts. Mm -hmm. Because how do you get there? What platforms do you use? And what technologies or what infrastructure do they ride over um, in order for information to get to, guess who, the user? And so um, uh, it's, it's um, if you're an academic, you're having a ball. Um, <laughs> but people in this room, I know, are, are frustrated because, um, because uh, when there's a final, final ruling after the dust is cleared um, legally, because everybody's challenging um, everyone else, um, we don't know uh, what the future is going to bring and the excitement for entrepreneurs and, and, and um, you know, innovators and, uh, you know, uh, those who can't afford a storefront, um, those who, um, you know, don't have access to information and those who rely on you for their uh, information. What does that mean for them in terms of um, how they get there and how they interact with you? Because going back to the beginning of the, um, uh, of the further notice, when you have these tensions and when you have upwards of 20% of the people not um, being able to get their information online, they're gonna rely on you. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to be the conduit or, or the, um, because you're, are by your very nature the most accessible network or platform for them to do that. You're going to have to be the backstop or the substitute for them if they not they're not connected. If they cannot get to those meetings and the like. And so that's why um, you know I, 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 I'm so passionate about um, you know if you feel at all discouraged. I'm, I'm not a preacher, and I'm really not a preacher. Um, <laughs> in so many ways, I'm not. Um, but, you know, it, it is important for you to, um, you know, allow the, these interactions to reinforce what your obligation, um, you know, is, um, you know, as, as, as content uh, creators and disseminators, because there are too many people who don't have access and you're gonna to have to be their eyes, ears, and information sources um, uh, in order to fill those gaps until we get the policy part of it right. I'll jump in, it's a good segue. We love segues in radio. Um, I grew up in the mountains of rural Colorado and left, I've left and returned to my home three different times. The first time was to seek an education um, and the second time was um, to, to make those opportunities available to my kids and to do that I needed um, better work opportunities and uh, I, I actually then moved NFCB three different times in locations around my my home area because um, because I didn't have enough broadband access to 
join Ernesto on a webinar or get involved with a conference call that happened to have a video feed. And so then this is now the third time that I've come back. And the way I was able to do that is because our local rural electric cooperative took up last mile to the home mm. and um, had had some fiber in the ground and stepped up to the plate to make that happen and this is a lifeline for rural communities because it allows people to come in and and be part of a community and continue to work um so it's okay if my face isn't on the uh, okay. screen okay. i'm, I'm so actually worried about it, no 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 i'm i'm, okay. I'm delighted we're, we're trying to work <laughs> we're trying to work. yeah yeah you know, it's weird it's like looking in the in the, in the mirror yeah. it's like that flip yeah. thing i was like yeah, yeah okay <laughs> so i do think that's an interesting thing and i i think it's really profound what you're talking about in terms of distilling it down to the essential tension being between the user and the owner and how um how that really does reach every aspect of society right now. So we talk about it in relevance to community media or public access television, but you know, it, I think it begs the larger question of what does it mean for our democracy when we cannot articulate a social contract? Mm -hmm. And I think what I have noticed in paying attention to this space um, is that ebb and flow of the tension between the user and the owner and you clearly you saw under Mike, Michael Powell the you know movement towards more consolidation and then and then you really saw the FCC rally mm -hmm. to say wait a minute this is disturbing and this was designed in this way and here's what's happening and you know LPFM and those open windows was a big part of that that I cer I certainly perceived many folks at the FCC took a great deal of pride in you know but what I have witnessed now is that this whole tension between content and user has gone to a completely different planet, really, at this point. Because what you see is a regulatory agency that, as annoying as it sometimes is, or as kind of, you know, um, uh, onerous as it can sometimes be, uh, was not a propaganda machine. And it has become that, in my opinion. I don't know what you know, who's going to pick this up and come after me about it, but I'll tell you what, you go to Ajit Pai's main page and his f FAQ on net neutrality alone, read that. There's 12 questions and about 15 times if you just want to circle the word heavy-handed in front of Obama administration mm -hmm. referring to the 2015 changes, that is not information, that is propaganda. Mm -hmm. And so you have the regulatory agency charged with holding that space for our democracy now creating the propaganda that tilts the balance to the owner away from the user, in my opinion. So I think that is a really, really challenging uh, scenario for, for people to be in. And one that, in my opinion, makes it uh, it completely obliterates the legitimacy of a regulatory agency when you make laws that are unenforceable or regulations or you undermine them with your own propaganda agenda. And I really like the framing of the owner and the user, but let's look at it this way. The whole way cable franchising came into being is because local governments, local communities own our right-of-way and our mm -hmm. streets. And so in this instance, local communities are the owners of this very valuable property. And what the FCC in effect is doing is taking that property away and giving the value for free to the internet service providers. That's where we really need to draw the line because those monies at least you have an opportunity in your local community to talk with your elected officials about how those monies are used. But with, with, with these orders, those monies are evaporating. And, you know, let's face it, we need resources to do this important work. So it's just the owner user is flipped in this instance because we're the owners and they're taking our property. And then one interesting thing is that, you know, I looked at my cable bill the other day and told my sons that I was going to cut it. And they're like, but dad, you can't. It supports your industry. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> they, they finally figured out what I do. And I was like, well, I want to get rid of this extra package. Not until I got, it's my only outlet. I'm in, you know, I'm a senior. I'm like, okay. So I called them. 
you know, I look at, I tell people, I ask people if, if they're subscribers, and I say, do you ever look at that thing at the bottom of your bill that says the franchise tax? Mm -hmm. That's what pays for what we're doing. And I had inter two interesting conversations this week. One interesting conversation was about, you know, people are talking about all of this regulation, but the actual tax, you know, and this, the, the cable companies aren't paying for that. Oh, no. All of the subscribers are paying for that. So they're doing another property grab on the money that they're not even paying. They're just facilitating. It, it's, 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 it boggles the mind, one, on that. And then on the, and the other one is just as a side note, someone who just joined our organization said that, well, you know, I, I cut the cord a few years ago. I thought I was, I was sticking it to the man. And I was like, no, you were sticking it to us. <laughs> and, you know, I never thought I'd be a proponent for, right. you know, uh, you know, industry per se, and I'm and I'm an old Hollywood guy, and so I understand that side of the argument. But, but when I started this job, and I knew the cable people were there at the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Public Hearing, my first one, I said to them in, in the public comments, I believe that if they were smart, they'd work with us and they'd preserve what we're doing because we're we're a, a we're a why buy, we're a reason why people should stay subscribers. And then the third thing was that now when you call about your bill and they used to like send you to the retention specialists and all that stuff they've given up the fight they just go well what internet speed do you want so they you know that same wire that same cable that's bringing all this to my house the moment i turn off the video part of it is the moment the franchise tax goes away the moment the support to our industry goes away and the moment that they just get richer and it's already been built out and paid for on the back of this other thing so just from a these are just some common sense kind of front porch observations i don't know where more to go with that but it just it's been interesting it's, i guess it's been the only way i've been able to deal with some of the more horrific things is by looking at some of these more anecdotal things so i just i wanted to put that out there and just maybe after this is over if anybody's got any insights i'd be i'd be very happy to, we'll charge to you for that, that therapy fit yes. <laughs> <laughs> i'll pay i need it so we have the devastating things and we've painted that picture um i'd love to hear from you what are some of the effective things that we can do at well, this point what what actually lands and registers so um the one thing that I see, and, and it's been brought up that the more than, you know, 20 some odd states, you know, have sort of hard and fast, you know, rules and essence, you know, preempting state and the, the local governments from, you know, doing anything. Um, I, I think um, if it were me, um, that a, a, a massive re-education um, uh, initiative needs to take place. Because, uh, you know, one of the things that I find for people who do uh, the best or make their best efforts or, you know, very targeted and, and working hard is we're too often trees in the forest. Mm. And so when the branch breaks or something, you know, the, 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 the leaf, you know, fall, you know, a leaf may fall, you know, nobody notices until the whole tree is bare or if it drops, if they even hear it. Um, and so uh, the things that I know, because I've been to a couple of properties and met a couple of you that you're doing that are, in essence, economic markers in the communities. Um, you know, again, information, um, you know, that, uh, that is disseminating that would not, um, you know, be so or, or happen under any other, you know, platform. Um, I think people need to be reminded of that. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't know how often you go to city council meetings and brag about you know oh you know what what you're doing or let them know about what you're doing. If you haven't been lately, um, check out the schedule the next time they have a you know these are the types of things. And I'm not uh, you know I have to be careful because I'm not supposed to. I can just there's certain things I can't do or say, but um, you know hopefully I, I can say that because it's been said. Um, and and so these are the types of things because again people don't know. People take it for granted. Um, you know, people know you by um, you know what you do, and 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 know you that um, you know you know that that good natured, uh, you know, community driven individual, and um, you know saying you you gonna get to heaven, but not paying attention to what's going on on earth. You know, these are the types of things that we not need to kind of remind people about, and 
letting them know what it takes, what it will take by way of different agreements, you know, reminding or, or asking that legislate uh, toward that um, only heard probably one side of the, um, uh, you know, of the argument, and that's why they voted for, uh, you know, the preemption, but what it actually will mean. Um, you've got to make your own business case. I, I just, I'll just, you know, be, I'm, I'm not ever succinct, but you just, you have to make your own business case. Um, because I think if that were successful and you had a willing listener by way of a decision maker, be it city council person or, or um, you know, those in, in the general assembly, um, that we wouldn't have as many of these challenges as we do. Because who am, who am I keeping from doing something wrong? Who am I educating? Who am I informing? Um, you know, who knows something that they, um, uh, you know, the tools that I provided for them to do something, you know, better, m more meaningful, um, and, you know, those antidotes matter. That's how everybody else makes their case. So we're not reinventing. This is this is not you know coming up with you know a, a new and novel application. This is applying uh, what we know that already works, what we're already doing, um, and disseminating um, our, our own information. You know, letting the public and decision makers know what we do. No matter how well you're doing it, you know you can do it better. I think another um, hopeful sign um, in different communities and right here in the Portland Multnomah County is there's a very strong grassroots group that has um, gotten the local governments together to fund a feasibility study for a municipal fiber network. Yeah. Now when the community owns the network, the community can decide that net neutrality is foundational. Mm -hmm. Digital inclusion is foundational. You begin to make those decisions locally and you can, uh, through your network, express the values that that community has. So there are, oh, I don't know, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance mm -hmm. has a map and there are several hundred community networks and in that they do include the rural electric co-ops that are providing internet because that's like a homegrown and so the CEO might live next door to you as opposed to a corporate you know the larger ISPs where they're somewhere else and all the big decisions are made in one case in Philadelphia mm -hmm. and in another case in Louisiana for the providers here. Um, but so and so I, we're very excited locally here about that and it totally sprang from the community because they were sick and tired of the treatment by the large uh, corporate ISPs. Um, not quite yet. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, MuniNetworks.org is the URL for um, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and the Community Networks page where you can see that. What was that again? Uh, MuniNetworks.org. Muni or Muni? Muni as in municipal. M-U-N-I. Mm -hmm. You were a proponent of public hearings when you were at the FCC. Uh, why does the FCC no longer do those? And do you think that they are effective? And should we be doing people's forums or people's hearings? So if you were to ask anybody, um, you know, my parents uh, were uh, students of history. One is a librarian, one one um, as a history teacher. And they will infirm, not endorse what I'm about to say, the most efficient form of governance is a self-contained one. I, I won't use the, the, the term that we often use, a self-contained one that makes decisions based on narrow um, interactions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's efficient. The most effective form of government mm -hmm. is one that's a little messy, mm -hmm. that goes outside of its cocoon, its own infrastructure, to see whether or not the decisions they make will enable opportunities at the state and local level. So I guess I've answered it as succinctly as I know how to. Um, it is rather, it is if you as a decision and policy maker 
are looking for answers that bubble up, that de directly address what is going on in these communities, or if your universe of, uh, uh, of where you get the information or informed, if it's more narrow, if it's more corporate, uh, and I'm just gonna be, be as plain spoken as I know how, how to be, it, it, it just depends on how you're wired. I am naturally wired. Um, I mean, I like people most days. Today, you know, it depends on what hour you catch me. A little later in the day when I'm on East Coast time, I'm not gonna be so friendly. <laughs> but, but I really look to be informed, enlightened, and that is how I, in terms of my decision making, making matrix, those are the, the, the components that I need um, because I can be efficient, but I prefer to be effective. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, you know, you know that that's just uh, it's just how you're wired and how you process and and um, and you know because a decision is going to be made. Does that decision have a uh, enabling, inclusive ripple effect that will allow communities to better thrive? Or will it, um, you know, stop innovation, stop inclusion, stop opportunities? Um, you know, you know, right there after after um, the um, federal register, uh, um, you know, after you send it to the federal register. And so uh, it. Uh, it, sounds, I, I it sounds like it comes down to whether you have uh, a willingness to be curious, mm. or you just want to be lazy and be fed pablum from analysts. So I'm not going to embrace the word lazy, you, yeah. but you lose. I'm not going to argue my, my with you. My words, my right? words. Um, but, um, you know, and I really, um, you know. Less curious. You, <laughs> I, I really am, uh, am, you know, for today, I always pick a word of the day. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, reaffirm too. Efficient. Mm -hmm. Do we want to be efficient or effective? Mm -hmm. I mean, and to me, you know, the, that's the underlying question. Do we want to be efficient or effective? Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, that just governs and informs um, and explains, you know, other than, you know, the user versus the own, owner owners. That to me explains every vote, you know, every policy decision that anybody makes. It, it just really does. Um, and so I'm, I'm not arguing with you. I'm just just going on the record right, as saying right. I didn't say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I get defocused on the on the uh, internet stream. <laughs> Something that I find heartening in this mix is that um, when there's a big bad thing happening. Um, we have a news peg. We have something to talk about in our communities and with media. And it's, it's a leadership development opportunity. It's an opportunity to see who steps forward, who's passionate, who wants to talk about these issues in our communities, and, and we can connect with those folks and they can join our organizing and advocacy efforts. Um, in 2007, when we had an FCC hearing in Seattle, it was an amazing opportunity for organizing up and down the I-5 corridor. And some of you from this area actually came up for right. that. It was, yeah. it was amazing. Folks from Picoon brought a bus of folks. But we just like went throughout the region and did workshops <laughs> where we worked with folks so they could identify and feel confident about their testimony at the hearing. And um, there were folks that were at that hearing that <laughs> stayed involved in media justice and media reform work and in community-based media organizations. Um, and we had some fun. We had some media consolidation zombies, <laughs> um, worked with a public artist, um, and came up with some really great images um, to help tell the story. Mm -hmm. And folks had so much fun with that, but also it made the news. It got on the front page of several outlets and on the TV. Um, well. You know, maybe we should think about recreating that. Ours was in 2004. It was oh. a community media town hall. Mm -hmm. We had 400 people, mm -hmm. just regular people right. who feel passionate about these issues. And, you know, of course, the draw was the, the FCC commissioners who cared. Right, and I think it was Michael Cobbs and Jonathan Adelstein. Yes, mm -hmm. they came. Um, but, you know, now we don't have that. But I think we need to recreate that energy because a lot of good came out of those media town halls. 
a lot of activism, and as you say, Sabrina, a lot of new people got involved. One of the things I was excited about um, when I came to the EFCC was we were developing a national broadband plan. Yes. And, you know, and I said I could not have picked, well, it was picked for me, but you know how you get um, with your ego. I could not have picked a more perfect time um, to come into this space, you know, to move in from South Carolina, you know, being a, um, a, a, a relatively small uh, regulatory uh, fish, um, you know, to, uh, you know, on a one of five that crafting national and international, you know, policy um, in, in D.C. What the broadband plan sought to do was to lay out a framework chapter by chapter looking at our nation's needs, education, health, civic engagement. I'm leaving out six chapters. Um, but, you know, these are the types of things because it bubbled up from the community and it looked at what can a broadband-enabled infrastructure do to further, um, you know, these objectives, these national priorities is what we called it, um, uh, you, know, you know, in these communities. You know, what do the communities need? And how can the government, particularly the federal government, through this plan, lay out this blueprint, you know, for us to follow? And believe it or not, when you look at many of the chapters, um, you know, the FCC did not do a bad job of following, um, you know, that um, through its policy, through its universal service policies. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm dropping USF or universal service for a reason, because its goal is noble. It seeks to connect every citizen with advanced communication services. That's the goal of it. The challenge is the execution of it. Mm -hmm. The challenge um, is, you know, creating, you know, the partnerships and, and, and making sure that the monies are used efficiently and not rebuilding and overbuilding and, and um, you know, keeping current silos that won't allow us to really address the needs. That's, that's the current day challenge. But the goal of universal service is a noble one. And I think if we were to take those goals and objectives that are noble, that are universal service in nature, that are by going back to what I mentioned about, um, you know, what the uh, the um, designers of the internet um, sought to do, this platform that's neutral, inclusive, um, that uh, you know, you know, that a provider cannot dictate, you know, what your interaction is. Um, I think, and I know, I don't even think this, I am sure of this, that we will have a framework for addressing all of these opportunities and digital and platform divides and challenges that we have. But it has to start by getting out of your DC Beltway silo and going into the communities, uh, you know, the, the, these, you know, 50 states plus other regions, I don't like to use the word territories, because we cannot forget our citizens, um, you know, who are not necessarily mm -hmm. attached to us, um, you know, geographically. I know Alaska and Hawaii, but, you know, I, I do know a little bit. But, you know, others, because I know Alaskans think they're the center of the universe. Hmm. They're not. But anyway, we love you anyway. Um, but, you know, you, you look at, you know, what the needs of the communities are and address them through that universal service lens. Um, and, you know, I, I just think... Um, um, that it will force us to um, answer questions and to move in um, a policy and policy making directions at all levels of government um, that will um, uh, close these chronic divides. We've been talking about communities, and I, I, I don't you you see them people every day for the past thirty or no more years have had persistent poverty and other issues. Why is that? I believe what I'm about to say, this is the greatest nation in the world. I, I believe that. It, it, it's, some, it's painful sometimes it is for me to get out, roll out of bed and go back into bed and be able to sleep. I, I believe that. Why is it that we're talking about the same issues um, the, the, the day that I was born? Why is it that the same communities that I passed by, that my family grew up um, in, and I can name some cities that, to me, 
but I'm friends with the mayors, so I won't. Um, that we're talking about the same boarded up buildings, just the same disconnections, the same type of redlining. Why are we still having these conversations? It's because we're not looking through a universal service lens. I'm convinced of that. We're not looking at uh, through a lens that will actually solve the problem, not criticize the people who have the problems. Mm -hmm. That's that's the challenge for all of us. Um, and you know, sorry about me being preachy and, and in need of um, therapy, but this <laughs> is um, you know this is the question that we're going to have to ask. This is the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say under this uh, because I know we need to open things up. When I was growing up, listening to my father, who is uh, who's got his own, um, uh, who who's pretty well known. <laughs> he would tell the story about um, his parents, often his mother, saying to him, the reason why I do what I do is I want it to be easier for you than it was for me. So many stats that we're seeing today are saying that the parents of these children are always going to have an economic advantage. That's problematic. Because that's not patching, passing on that baton of a better dream and opportunity uh, for too many, uh, you know, in our communities. That's fixable. And I don't care what the vote is tomorrow. <laughs> and I do care what the vote is tomorrow, the outcome. Um, you know, I don't care what's happening tomorrow or going forward. If we allow ourselves to be um, the other noise to take us away from that focus, then we're going to have, some of us going to have, you know, in, in, in our nursing homes, the same conversations with our great grandkids. Mm -hmm. And I find that troubling. And so each of us has an opportunity through platforms, through government, whether you're current or former, whether you have a vote or not, to really short circuit. Um, you know, these um, barriers to making the scenario that I just laid out, you know, a thing of the past. We can do this. We've done a lot of other things. Um, you know, if we can create billionaires in 20 years that are, you know, that are under 40, we can, f we can fix the persistent poverty and persistent opportunity divides in our communities. You can't tell me it's not possible. Efficient, effective. I'll say amen. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, there's some questions in the room. Yeah. And OK, I'm seeing I, like I, four I, or five. The gentleman, he raised his hand first with the, with the beige. Right the gentleman in the beige jacket apparently raised his hand first. <laughs> I'm trying to look out for you. <laughs> okay. He did that, so now, good. And, Thank and you. What you said about efficiency and effectiveness is, is very important here because in the public dialogue that I hear now, uh, I'm hearing broadcasting uh, is old technology mm -hmm. and that. Uh, the cable companies are going to uh, allow us to be more efficient with the use of the spectrum. And then, you know, we're in this pilot plan for the last 20 years to sell off the public spectrum mm -hmm. to to the cell phone companies. That, that I mean, they don't get licenses. They buy, and that's what that big. repack. Yeah. We just lost half of the capacity for uh, television. And they say now, oh well, we'll never need 88 to 108 because it, you can't use that frequency as a as well as these other frequencies, but the technology is going to evolve to where our channels will be important. You said, suggest that uh, to serve these unserved people, because I'm from a rural area, mm -hmm. and I know people that live within 40 miles of the international headquarters of AT&T in San Antonio that can't even get DSL in their homes. They are lucky to get you know modem speeds, and in my co-op where I live. Uh, I'm kind of in the backwater of my co-op where everybody gets gets digital cable over by the lake, but you know my little edge of the world, I'm I'm stopped at eight megabits, so I can't get cable there. I have to go 
for you know direct TV or something like that. Uh, so uh, it, it, I guess it concerns me that where I hear this dialogue of we don't need broadcasting anymore and we're going to serve more efficiently by turning the spectrum over uh, to the uh, IP providers. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, it, what it's going to do is our little broadcasting link where we are, you know, vocalism is all important. And even in my co-op, they don't even have uh, <laughs> PEG in my co-op. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't even do local ad insertion there. Wow. All they do is deliver these national channels. So there is no vocalism delivered except through, you know, broadcasting. And uh, I guess, uh, and being from Texas, uh, which people used to, like, uh, I can remember when people used to help me to say you're from Texas, people would open their eyes and wonder about it. Now people kind of cringe that this is where the source of everything bad is coming from. It's like, how, how can we start this dialogue uh, to, like, reinforce the uh, broadcasting to see that these funds that are available for rural access, uh, what they end up doing in Texas is they go and fund uh, sub suburbia spread and they don't bring, uh, you know, people, farmers, you know, people like that, uh, internet. Uh, it all goes to, like, Sugarland, which is a bedroom community of Houston. Mm. And uh, how, how can we, uh, you know, in a way I feel like uh, my elected officials, uh, you know, although that may change in the next few months, you know, they don't really care about uh, these issues like I do. You know, I can't call up John Cornyn and, uh, or, or, or get Cruz and talk to them about uh, telecommunications policy. Well, I find that curious in some ways, not surprising, but curious, because if you look at, if, we were, if you were to look at the makeup of the House of Representatives, most of those individuals are from rural communities. And you will have some people with urban envy that would point that out. And, and it would say almost just the opposite of what you're saying in every other sphere. I'm not, I'm not minimizing what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So to that point, how the things that you're mentioning that could be bolstered the argument, well, the, I, said, I wasn't going to say that word, the positions when it comes to um, the next evolution when it comes to uh, agricultural in, in the business, when it comes to telehealth and telemedicine, you know, particularly in those communities where there's not a provide, you know, a, 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 you don't have a provider, a healthcare provider nearby. What are the types, what are the tools that those communities where people live, the breadbasket literally, you know, uh, uh, breadbaskets of America, what are the tools that they need and what are the benefits? And I'm, I'm going back to what I said about making a business case. There's an economic business case that you can make for every hamlet in this nation by looking at what its strengths are, what it delivers, what it contributes, and the things that they need in order to do that more efficiently. And so I, I really think, and, and I'm working through this as a, 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 a my next evolutionary business model. Honestly, I'm really thinking about this hard as, as I project this, um, you know, to you. How do we better message what I call the uh, avoided cost models? And what I mean by that is what we're not doing, what it's costing, and the cost that we could avoid for those inefficiencies um, in those communities that are being ignored or redlined or, or, or whatever, whatever frame. Uh, because there's a cost to be made by not investing, you know, by not delivering services, you know, by not paying attention to those communities. There's a cost to us, whether it's you could have avoided a heart attack with better information and in, in, um, in monitoring. Now I'm going to spend weeks in the hospital and, and I've got to recover. How much is that going to cost the fund, you know, the, the um, you know, our state Medicaid fund? These are the types of things that I think, honestly, it won't take a lot, but we, you know, I think the desire, if I were to craft it, um, how do we make the case for everything you're, you're, you're saying to those particular lawmakers who you don't feel that aren't listening? Because the investment will pay dividends in terms of health care savings, you know, again, better delivery of services, you know, better delivery of the resources, I meant to say, you know, there. There's a case to be made. 
um, we just need to, uh, you know, sometimes as, as well-intentioned as we are, how can we recalibrate or, or re-engineer our messaging in a way in which these policymakers and, and, and lawmakers um, uh, can hear? Everybody wants savings. Everybody wants more money. They, you know, they want more, in, uh, uh, attract more industry to their regions. Technology to me is, is 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 a nice carrot. How can we better do that? So I don't know if I directly answered your question, but you know, to me, it's kind of throwing it back. What the case can we make to those lawmakers that they can't refuse, um, that they can't ignore, because it would uplift, um, you know, everybody in our communities. So that's how I'm trying to think about, you know, trying trying to make the case for others who seem, through current lenses, seem resistant to change or doing something different. I think to add to that, um, my observation around um, the country is that in rural communities that have been successful with either the co-op model or a community broadband network, almost universally there has been a local broadband champion. And so, and then when you talk about those electeds, electeds like to hear from other electeds. So maybe if, you know, go to your local local, you know, like your council or county person, yeah. if they could become a champion, and really it's just a matter of educating them and they can become the champion, they then, they're better received for some reason, <laughs> you know, as you go up the, the food chain. Um, but really, somehow we need to figure out a way to identify and nurture these local champions because they really do make a difference. There could be several champions right here in this room. Um, just to, to uh, connect the dots, um, if anyone is interested in doing local organizing around these issues, um, please uh, meet me in the hallway afterward. Um, and I'd love to get your contact information so that we can keep in touch and support each other and come up with some plans. I think I saw Vanessa and then Clay. The folks behind you. Over here. Oh, a whole bunch of people behind you. So my name is Vanessa. I'm from Philly Cam, which is a community uh, media access center that also has an LPFM. And I've been working on LPFM and net neutrality um, for many years now. As you know, Comcast is headquartered in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And um, I just feel like, you know, we really need to address the real problem, which is the huge influence that Citizens United has had in corporations being able to funnel money towards our legislators. And this is like especially true in Philadelphia, where they fund both parties and it's been really, really difficult to convince them. And we've done everything we're supposed to do in terms of organizing people, getting local media coverage working in national coalitions, developing media content through independent media coalitions and partners. And we have had no success in, in moving some legislators like whatsoever. Dwight Evans is a Democrat. He's a congressman, and he is not signing on to the discharge petition for net neutrality. We tried to, uh, we scheduled a meeting with a delegation in DC. They blew us off. We've tried to contact them, call them. We went to his office to deliver thousands of petitions. They called the police on us. Um, we had an action at Comcast where the militarized police was also sent in to arrest people. I just feel like we need to start thinking of ways to uh, build our own networks and our own infrastructure because it's been incredibly difficult through grassroots organizing and working with advocacy organizations to change people. And when we looked into Dwight Evans, his biggest contributor is Comcast, right? And so um, I don't feel like there's a lack of capacity towards creating messages and providing evidence. And even in his district, thousands of people submitted comments to the FCC process. So um, there was an attempt to apply for funds from the federal government to build a municipal broadband network, but Comcast was able to shoot that down as well. And so I just want to know like how we can build power like amongst ourselves and start to like imagine other ways 
uh, so that we are not dependent on corporations for the infrastructure, like mesh networks and other like municipal things, and how we can figure out ways, you know, to um, work together to develop like these other models and bring them. Because right now, the traditional modes of grassroots organizing are not what I see like being really effective. And then with our last franchise agreement, same thing, we rallied people, we went to city council meetings, we made media, we petitioned people, and the city even commissioned a study to study Philly Cam um, through an independent uh, entity. And they said in that study that they needed to raise our budget by $5 million. Instead, they cut it by 12%. And so um, we really are seeing like the effects of this. And I just want to know, like, what other advocacy organizations can we look to? I've been working specifically with Free Press and Center for Media Justice. But who else can we join? And, like, what can we do in this room to sort of be in solidarity and build power? And I'm sure you know about um, Diana Sarah's work in Detroit with the Equitable Internet Initiative um, that um, an LPFM is actually also involved with, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, there, there are some of those bright spots around the country where folks are doing that. But yeah, Philly's a really frustrating situation. There's a, a couple other places. One that we already mentioned earlier, which was the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, because they're big advocates for community networks, but then also CLIC, Communities for Local Internet Choice. Um, that's their whole goal. They're, you know, the idea is that the community decides. Um, and there are a lot of resources there, and some of these groups have, you know, gatherings to share information and strategies that work. Yeah, and maybe international models as well um, for self-sustainability. Do you have anything that you'd want to? No. Okay. I think I think you identified it. Okay, we had a bunch of folks. Clay, um, what does your question pertain to? <laughs> To this discussion. <laughs> okay, but, all right, go, <laughs> go for it, and then we're going over um, back here. No, just there, there were okay. a number of things that resonate with me. Uh, 20 years ago, and congratulations on Metro East. 20 years ago, Rob Brading uh, and I were part of the Community Media Leadership Conference while I was in Contra Costa County serving on the Telecom Task Force, and we envisioned, um, uh, in response to then the 96 Telecom Act, trying to get an act uh, passed uh, through Congress uh, declaring all spectrum, not just the public airwaves as public usage and turn the tables and rather than public access, provide corporate access. But anyway, just some food for thought. Um, this thing that's going on with the uh, revision of the uh, Cable Act 621, um, is maybe, and you mentioned the community meet, community media, um, community assessment, community meetings. Um, some of you here are from radio and you, CPB has what they call a community needs assessment process, ascertaining community needs. It's actually quite weak and thin and uh, narrow, but the community needs assessment that uh, happens in cable is uh, much more broad and uh, comprehensive. And I'm wondering if, for example, what if you were to invite uh, Commissioner Warson, uh, uh, Jessica Warson. Rosen Warsaw. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jessica. Um, to to come, I mean, before Cobbs and Edelstein did it just on their own initiative dime, but maybe you can invite them. And maybe also turn that into a community needs ascertainment uh, gathering process. Um, and maybe even enter those comments into the rulemaking. Mm -hmm. Just move the thought, you know, just kind of provoke some thought here. Thank you. Yes. My name is Luke. Uh, my paying job is a is I work as a network engineer for a large nonprofit. The first thing I want to say that kind of overlooked a little bit is you can build your own networks yeah. in communities. Yeah. There are companies like Ubiquity, I use a lot of their equipment. You have the same ability to access the same equipment that internet service providers do and to build your own local networks that route. The only trick would be getting them to route to the main internet network, 
but as far as your local community, you can't do that. The question I had is, personally, I have friends younger and older who ask me the question, how does the internet work? Can we run out of it? So my question to you all is, do you feel that a lack of education amongst our communities lends to people not really understanding and getting involved and in understanding how important these things are? One point I'd like to make is a lot of people don't understand, you all here do, that the internet is definitely built on open standards. There's even a standard called the OSI model. Um, that this is all, that's how it is, is intended. It's like you said, it's how it is designed. Do you feel that if we were able to educate people more on these, that they would be able to get a better grasp and understanding of how important it is and that the way that everything works now, being controlled by large corporations, really isn't the way that it should work? So that's a, uh, you uh, really, um, uh, your question really to me requires several different, um, you know, approaches and responses. Um, because again, when you're talking about explaining um, the value, um, you know, of this platform, it always will depend on who it is, who the audience is, and how they process. Um, you know, uh, and, and what their interest in, in terms of the level of specificity, um, you, you know, when it, when it comes to the explanation. And I keep it again, I said it from the beginning, I'm up here, you guys are more in the weeds. But for me, it is what we believe we have now by way of access and opportunities is not guaranteed. There's absolutely nothing by way of any of the freedoms or opportunities we have right now. They're not guaranteed. They really are not. All of these things, when we talked about the history and the evolution of the internet, and if you were to go back and look at the history and the evolution of this country, it, it was a series of building blocks. Some of those blocks weren't so pleasant and we had to reconstruct because luckily they crumbled. And so, you know, to me when we talk about, you know, the platforms, it's not, it's not divorced or, you know, isolated from that. You know, you got, you know, you know Marty and, and, you know, all of those in the room that, um, um, you know, that, that crafted, you know, the formalized platform that they envisioned in a certain way, um, you know, through our, you know, you, 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 they did this. But now it's the human slash regulatory application of it and how it's interpreted and appropriated and how rules and laws through the different, you know, evolutionary cycles, how they are applied. And so I, I, I'm being a PK, a politician's kid, and not directly answering your question because there's not a direct answer. Uh, you know, with you know, from where I sit, the other two smarter people here, you know, they, three, they might be able to do it better. To me, it is how this particular platform meets the changing, evolving needs of communities. Mm -hmm. And if we, as individuals, regulators, lawmakers are doing what it takes, are being nimble enough with our um, decisions to make sure that that happens. Because what was needed in this more um, naturally open platform in the 1970s when we were in a dial-up, right. moving to a DSL, um, you know, that's not what it, you know, took when it came to DOCSIS and, you know, and, and you know, how we, uh, you know, moved away from, um, you know, those, um, uh, preliminary or, or those platforms of the 70s and 80s to now. And so if we're willing to change and evolve from a policymaking standpoint, and for me, I think we're stuck, if not going back from policymaking. That's my personal, very biased, based on, I think, some decision making. That's my, um, that's how I look at it. But if we're willing to, all of us, even people like me who, are, are, are very, um, very set in our ways. But if we will, are willing to have a, a conversation based on what the community's needs are and making sure we're crafting a network of opportunities for these things to happen, then I think we'll get on a better plan. It's not gonna be a perfect, whatever we do, um, as, as much as I embrace the 2015 rules, 
there were some issues I had that you probably heard. Um, uh, you know, and one of the things that I was adamant about was making sure that mobile platforms had the same type of rules and um, you know as as is fixed. Mm -hmm. Because I could tell and knew then what we all know now, most of our households are mobile only. And how they're accessing the internet, if they can't afford a fixed um, network, is through this device. And if that's treated differently, then you know they're going to have a different experience. So I'll stop there because I'm you know just re re rehashing, but it, it just affirms the complexity. So the simple answer is yes. The complex answer is um, it's going to have to be tailored to uh, the person or the the constituency that you um, that you're delivering the message to. Our time is up. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're good. We wanted you to talk. <laughs> <laughs>